Chapter 8. Knowing is half the battle. Quote, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. End quote. Sun Tzu, from The Art of War. That very first time I ran out of pills after my two-month streak of daily opioid use, I didn't even know I was going through opioid withdrawal. I was naive and uneducated and simply thought I was having a massive panic attack. I received a text message saying that it wasn't a panic attack and that I was sick from coming off the pills. What a shock that was. I had no idea what opioids did to my brain. I was just swallowing and snorting pills all day every day and having the time of my life in the process. I should have known better too, as in the past, at various times in my 20s, I had gone through alcohol withdrawal, benzodiazepine withdrawal, nicotine withdrawal, cannabis withdrawal, SSRI withdrawal, and even methamphetamine withdrawal. Why I didn't realize the same could happen with opioids is beyond me. I guess I just wasn't thinking about the future and instead focusing on having fun using pills every day to make me feel great instead of anxious, depressed, tired, and to fill the void within me. Luckily, I went online and found out that Valium could help, and it worked wonderfully for me. From that day forward, whenever I was about to run out of pills and either didn't have the money to buy more or couldn't find any dealers that had them, I would desperately search for someone that had Valium, Ativan, Clonopin, or Xanax all in a class of drugs known as benzodiazepines, commonly called benzos, which are anxiolytics. Benzos work by binding to the GABA receptors in the brain, causing the production of massive amounts of GABA, an inhibitory neurotransmitter that acts as a powerful physical and mental relaxant. Benzos were the only thing I knew of at the time that could help me get through opioid withdrawal without feeling like I was in a living nightmare. Through more online research, I learned about something called the Thomas Recipe, which was a combination of six remedies, which included Valium or another benzo, and when used together, could alleviate opioid withdrawal symptoms even better than benzos alone. The Thomas Recipe was developed and published online by an opioid addict named Thomas, and it consists of using Valium or another benzo, Lopiramide HCL, the generic for Imodium AD, L-tyrosine, vitamin B6, a multivitamin mineral high in potassium, and hot baths. The Thomas recipe saved me a few times when I ran out of pills and my dealers were out of stock as well. But despite my ability to use the Thomas recipe to alleviate acute withdrawal during the first few days off opioids, I always became severely depressed and exhausted afterwards. Working full-time as a cook at a busy restaurant, and being a single dad to a baby girl was easy when I had opioids. But after a few days of detoxing using the Thomas recipe, I would become so exhausted that it was almost impossible to continue working and taking care of my daughter. Along with the exhaustion, I also had insomnia, anhedonia, the inability to feel pleasure, sore and achy muscles, no appetite, minor stomach issues, and intermittent anxiety ranging from mild to moderate to severe. Why was I still feeling so awful even weeks after I had detoxed from opioids? According to my online research, the acute withdrawal only lasts approximately four days when a person quits using short-acting opioids such as oxycodone and hydrocodone, which were the opioids I had been addicted to. But beyond those four days, I still felt like shit. I felt like the energizer bunny on opioids, but weeks and even months after quitting, I felt like I was out of gas and just running on fumes. The severe exhaustion, coupled with a debilitating depression and inability to feel any sort of joy or even contentment, was a combination that continued to lead to relapse. After a few weeks, and especially a few months, feeling these symptoms, I would say, fuck it, and rationalize that it was better to be addicted to opioids and have energy and be happy than to continue suffering so much. Even worse than quitting short-acting opioids, such as oxycodone and hydrocodone, was trying to get off Suboxone after I'd been using 8 milligrams daily for a few months in a row. I could easily get through the first two days of acute Suboxone withdrawal, 
As the main ingredient, the partial opioid agonist known as buprenorphine is long-acting. This means that it takes much longer for the buprenorphine to come out of your receptor sites, and thus you don't start to experience withdrawal for typically two to three days. Whereas quitting short-acting opioids cold turkey typically leads to withdrawal starting around 12 hours after the last time you take them. Coming off Suboxone cold turkey, or even after a taper, where you reduce your dose gradually over time, the fatigue and depression were even worse for me than the times I quit short-acting opioids. I just couldn't handle it. By the end of day three coming off Suboxone, I'd be so tired that I literally could barely get off the couch. Suboxone was a miracle when I first started using it for OUD. Instead of hustling to find pills and spending all of my money, borrowing from friends and selling my music equipment, I could spend a fraction of the money and only needed to use it one to two times a day, rather than having to use expensive pills four to eight times a day. Suboxone started off as a resource, but soon it led to negative consequences that I hated enduring. On Suboxone, I had a serious case of back knee, acne on the back, which was cystic acne, big red inflamed bumps that were tender and gross to look at. If it were just the cystic acne on my back, I wouldn't have cared so much. However, what the opiate replacement medication did to my face was devastating for me. It turned my face red and I experienced hot flashes on and off every day. It also made my skin dry and flaky and no amount of high quality moisturizer I tried effectively treated the condition. It was so embarrassing and when someone would remark on my dry flaky skin and ask why it did that, I would have a hot flash too. I don't care how well a medication works. If it makes my face look horrible and unhealthy, the shame and embarrassment from that is more painful to me than being addicted to oxycodone and hydrocodone and not having a face constantly flaky. I also thought to myself, if it's doing this crap to my back and face, how much is my liver being poisoned by this chemical drug? Many naturopaths and health experts believe that skin conditions often stem from dysfunction in the liver, and I figured the short-acting opioids must have been easier on my liver than the Suboxone. Thus, I ultimately got off Suboxone and managed to stay off for about four months without using short-acting opioids either. But the entire time, I felt tired and unhappy for the most part. Little did I know, back then, I was experiencing a phenomenon known as post-acute withdrawal syndrome, PAWS. PAWS is a biopsychosocial syndrome that results from the combination of two things, the damage drugs have done to the brain and the stress of having to live life without the drug or drugs you've used as a helpful resource to give you certain benefits. I didn't know I was suffering from pause at the time, and even if I did know the name of this second phase of withdrawal that comes after the acute phase of withdrawal, I wouldn't have known how to lessen the symptoms and shorten the duration of it. I was utterly clueless. Thus, when four months after I got off Suboxone, one of my dealers texted me to let me know that he had a superabundance of 5 mg oxycodone, I was sick and tired of feeling the way I felt, as I was still enduring minor symptoms of pause, and I just wanted to feel good again. That night, I bought 10 oxycodone for two reasons. I believed that since I had gone four months without opioids, now I'd be able to use them from time to time for recreational or self-medicating purposes. I also believed that I would no longer have a high tolerance due to my clean time, and thus it would only take one 5 milligram oxycodone to get me high and feeling the opioid energy and confidence effects. I was dead wrong on both of these assumptions. My tolerance was still high, although not quite as high as before, and I wasn't able to use them responsibly. That one night of snorting oxycodone led to me being a jobless and homeless heroin addict having to live at my parents' house, and that happened within less than six months after that night I relapsed when my dealer told me he had pills. It's almost impossible to overcome a life challenge as complicated as opioid addiction when you're not equipped with the right education and resources. The first time I ran out of pills, I didn't even know why I was sick. When I detoxed from Suboxone, I didn't know what post-acute withdrawal was, how long it lasted, how my brain chemistry was deficient, and how to lessen the symptoms and shorten the time span. I also didn't know that until I found healthy, adaptive tools and resources to overcome my anxiety, depression, adrenal fatigue, and the void within me, I would always be at risk of becoming re-addicted. There was just so much I didn't know. 
Opioid addiction is a chronic relapsing condition, and I didn't realize the extent of how hard it would be to remain opioid-free long-term. I thought that if I could just get through the detox, I'd never want to use those damn pills again. In reality, overcoming opioid addiction for life is much more complex of a process. So complex, in fact, that relapse rates have been estimated to be 90% to 95%. And as I stated before, I believe it's possible it's closer to 99%. These years of wanting and trying to quit opioids were futile for two main reasons. First, I didn't know the enemy. At first, I was so naive that I didn't even realize I would go through a withdrawal syndrome if I stopped cold turkey after only two months of daily use. Then, after learning about the opioid withdrawal syndrome the hard way, through experiencing it, I had to learn about pause the hard way by going through it. If these were the only two obstacles, it would have been hard enough, but there were many more things occurring under the surface that I wasn't aware of. It was only after years of researching opioid addiction and recovery and writing about these on my blog that I figured out all of the obstacles that a person faces when trying to quit and stay quit long term. And along with the obstacles, I also broke down the process, or what I call the five phases of opioid addiction recovery, that every person either knowingly or more often unknowingly goes through when they quit successfully and never look back. When I was trying to quit, I didn't know what I've now named the seven obstacles to opioid addiction recovery and the five phases of opioid addiction recovery. Since I wasn't aware of these, trying to recover from opioid addiction was like going to war without knowing the enemy. What do you think the odds are that you can win a war without knowing much or anything about the enemy? Yup, pretty bad. Additionally, back then I didn't know much about myself either. I was weak-minded and had poor habits and thought processes. I wasn't strong or courageous. I also wasn't very self-aware. Since I didn't know the enemy or myself, winning the war of opioid addiction recovery was close to impossible. It was only through a combination of luck, timing, grace, and perhaps even divine intervention that I was finally able to succeed by first quitting, then getting through post-acute withdrawal, then learning how to live life a new way and giving my mind, health, relationships, and life in general upgrade after upgrade. I used to watch the awesome cartoon called G.I. Joe as a little kid. At the end of each episode, it said, quote, And remember, kids, knowing is half the battle. End quote. In the case of recovering from opioid addiction, I'd say that knowing the enemy is one-fourth the battle, knowing yourself is another one-fourth the battle, and taking courageous, educated, and persistent, bold actions is the other 50% of the battle. You can also think of this process like an NFL football team. At the beginning of a new preseason, how likely would you expect a football team to make it to the Super Bowl and then win if they didn't know the strengths and weaknesses of the teams they were to play all season? How likely do you think they would be if they also didn't know their own strengths and weaknesses? I know, pretty lousy, right? Since the coaches of the teams know this, they watch the recorded games of all the other teams there to play. They study the games. They brainstorm with the other coaches and strategize. Then they teach their players the particular strategy for playing each different team. The coaches also figure out their own team's strengths and weaknesses. They then capitalize on and lead with their strengths whenever possible. By knowing a lot about the enemy as well as a lot about themselves, a team will actually have a chance to win. Without knowing about the enemy or themselves, it will be much harder than it has to be, and likely close to impossible. It was a Monday morning at work, and we were as busy as ever. Right after I finished screening the final person of the morning and preparing to hand them their intake paperwork, a woman walked into the waiting area of the methadone clinic where I worked as a counselor, and she looked like she was suffering badly. Oh man, I thought to myself. I bet she wants to do an intake, and I doubt the doctor will take anyone else today. Hi there, my name is Matt. I'm a counselor here, I said in a warm and caring tone, trying to convey compassion and to let her know that she could count on me to help her out in any way I was able to. I was wildly popular as a counselor at the opioid treatment program because I was young, a former opioid addict myself, had tattoos, 
cared deeply about my patients, and adjusted my counseling approaches for each individual. I just finished inpatient detox and I feel horrible. Please, can I get on methadone today? She was desperate, and I knew all too well that same feeling. Coming off opioids after long-term daily use leaves your brain in a deficient state that makes you susceptible to anxiety, depression, fear, and many other unpleasant feelings, including intense cravings to use opioids. I had felt this same way many times in my past life as an opioid addict. It's really late in the morning, and we've been super busy with all the previous intakes, but I'll tell you what, I will let the doctor know the state you're in, and I promise to do all I can to get you seen today, okay? I knew the only two factors determining whether or not the doctor would see her on such late notice today would be what time the doctor was scheduled to go to work at another clinic and the mood he was in. I walked out of the waiting room, which was full with standing room only at this point, and consisted of new patients filling out their intake paperwork and current patients waiting in line to take their daily dose of methadone. I proceeded down the narrow hallway, which was brightly lit, with several fluorescent lights until I reached the doctor's office, which was the last door on the left and just 10 feet before reaching the nurse's dosing window, where there was a male patient in his 40s drinking his dose of liquid methadone. Knock, knock, I said out loud as I simultaneously knocked gently on the door to the doctor's office, which was cracked open just a bit but closed enough to where I couldn't see in. Yeah, come in. The doctor said in a tone that sounded to me like he was in a good mood, which was a relief since sometimes he was in a very bad mood, and the tone of his voice was much different on those days. My stomach would sink when I knew he was in a bad mood but still needed to talk to him about something. Hey doc, a woman just came here who says she just finished inpatient detox and is feeling horrible. Looks like she's suffering from a massive case of post-acute withdrawal. If I screen her right now and she qualifies for methadone, could you squeeze her in? Fortunately, the doc was in a great mood and he didn't have to leave to go to work at another clinic for over three hours. And he was happy to squeeze her in. I screened her and she did qualify for long-term maintenance, LTD, which was our 180-day program where they would get stabilized on methadone, then taper off by the final day or before then, They could do another intake and switch to methadone maintenance, where there was no time limit and they could be on for many years, or even decades, or the entire rest of their life if they choose to. After the new patient finished filling out her intake paperwork in the waiting room, I took her upstairs to my office and told her to please take a seat. She commented on the nice view I had, which by my estimate about half of all the patients I saw while working there did. My office had a huge window, and you could see a bunch of trees, the mall, and rolling hills a few miles away in the background. My new patient said she had been smoking about a gram of black tar heroin a day on average for the past two years, and she was addicted to RX opioids for several years before that. At the inpatient detox she was just released from, they gave her Subutex for three days and then took her off it and for the next few days treated her withdrawal symptoms with low-dose clonidine, a blood pressure medicine, and Zofran, a nausea medicine. She said the entire time in detox she felt awful, and when she was released, the subutex had completely worn off, and now she felt so horrible she said her only options were to either buy more heroin or get on methadone. At traditional detox programs, the doctors prescribe various medications to treat opioid withdrawal symptoms. And depending on the place you go, they may do a great job at helping the patient feel comfortable while detoxing from opioids, or they may not do such a great job. Regardless of whether a patient is treated in the way they need to feel okay while detoxing, upon being released from detox, they almost always still feel significant physical and psychological symptoms of withdrawal. This is exactly what was happening with my new patient. She felt anxious, fearful, sore, tired, depressed, couldn't sleep, and had intense cravings to use heroin because she knew doing so would alleviate all of these symptoms within seconds. She told me her aftercare recommended was outpatient treatment, 
and that they wanted her to go to group counseling sessions and attend AA or NA meetings daily for 90 days and get a sponsor. However, when she left detox, all she could think about was using heroin because the withdrawal symptoms were still so chronic. Unfortunately for her and millions upon millions of others over the years, traditional treatment programs don't teach or utilize holistic treatment plans for treating the second phase of opioid withdrawal, which is the post-acute withdrawal phase. For a long-term daily opioid user, this phase of withdrawal can easily last for three to six weeks and often lasts for three to six months, and in more rare cases, up to a year and even longer. The symptoms are not as severe as the acute withdrawal, but their persistence lingering for so long makes them even more detrimental to achieving recovery for most individuals. And this was true for myself as well. The truth is, most opioid-dependent individuals and even traditional treatment programs aren't aware of the many obstacles that lie ahead for the person beyond getting through the acute opioid withdrawal phase. If getting through acute withdrawal and then going to counseling and 12-step meetings was all that a person needed, relapse rates for opioid addiction wouldn't be 90% to 95%, or by my estimate, closer to 99%. I call quitting opioids, quote, the war of your life, end quote, because there are several phases and each one presents its own difficult and unique challenges. And each one has different effective treatment protocols, which all need to be individualized and customized for the individual. In addition to the numerous phases of recovering from opioid dependence, there are also what I refer to as the seven obstacles to opioid addiction recovery, most of which are unknown to the vast majority of opioid dependent persons as well as traditional treatment centers. For most people that have been dependent on opioids long term, the process of detoxing, recovering, and avoiding relapse is almost impossible, or at least it can seem that way. Why? Much of the time, it's simply due to ignorance. Most opioid daily users that want to quit and attempt to do so may only know about the acute withdrawal, and many also know about the post-acute withdrawal as well, but that's the extent of their knowledge. If a person has a great plan to minimize symptoms during the acute withdrawal, it's rare that they've also created or had a treatment center create a customized biopsychosocial, environmental, spiritual, holistic treatment plan for the post-acute withdrawal phase and especially beyond healing from pause. To skyrocket the chances of overcoming opioid dependence for life and not just for a few weeks or months, it's paramount to become educated on the five phases of opioid recovery and the top seven obstacles to opioid recovery. It's also of the utmost importance to customize the process of going through these phases and how to customize the process of planning for and breaking through the seven obstacles that every person will face to some degree. In addition to the seven obstacles, depending on the person, there will almost always be even more obstacles, barriers, and roadblocks. And this complicates the process of becoming opioid-free, happy and healthy even further. However, there is no need to worry, because in the remainder of this book, I'm going to equip you with all of the education, resources, tools, strategies, and tactics you need to ultimately triumph and achieve your goal of being off opioids and feeling great without the opioid crutch you've been leaning on to live life. There is hope. All you need is the right information combined with a strong motivation to quit, and you can be successful. That, I promise you. But if either element is missing, it's almost impossible to quit, and your chances will be far lower than when you're armed with the right information, and you're also internally motivated to overcome your challenge. I'm about to share with you the five phases and the seven obstacles, and once you have learned about these, what to do with them, and the rest of the content in this book, you'll be like a Navy SEAL that is about to go on a mission. Navy SEALs prepare very much for their missions. They're trained by their superiors on every detail of the mission, including what the mission outcome is, what the obstacles will be, what the phases will be, and the step-by-step -step plan for how they will achieve the outcome successfully. Whether you like to think of opioid addiction recovery as a war to win, a Super Bowl to win, a Navy SEAL mission to successfully complete, or something else is up to you but I do recommend using one of these mental frameworks or using another one that resonates with you more. 
Do this and you're well on your way to achieving your goal of being opioid free forever. The top seven obstacles. One, the addicted brain, the hijacked midbrain. In chemical dependency, something dreadful happens after the individual has been using their drug of choice for a while. Their brain chemistry changes. They need that particular substance. Drugs are amazingly powerful. Our bodies weren't meant to handle these concentrated substances. So after a period of continuous use, brain chemistry can short circuit. It actually rewires itself in a disastrous way. In a healthy individual, water, food, shelter, defending from predators, and sex are at the top of the survival hierarchy of needs. In a non-addict, the drug is just a drug. They can take it or leave it. Examples of non-addicts are experimentals, recreational users, regular users, medicinal users, and abusers. In chemical dependency, the brain short circuits and reorganizes this ladder of importance. It places the drug at the top of the list. Their newly rewired brain literally makes the following powerful connection. Drug equals survival. Why does the drug now equal survival? It's because drugs act on the midbrain, unconscious, which is the primitive part that deals with survival. The Olds experiments of the 1960s confirmed this. The Olds experiments. Researchers believed that drugs acted on the prefrontal cortex, conscious, which is the logical part that deals with personality expression, decision-making, and moderating social behavior. They injected cocaine into mice in the prefrontal cortex over and over, and the mice never became addicted. After poking all over their brains, they made an important discovery. When they injected cocaine into the midbrain, the mice would continue to press the lever to receive more of the drug, even when the ground beneath them was shocking them to death, and all they had to do to survive was stop lever pressing and move away. Furthermore, mice would die of thirst or starvation even when they had full access to food and water. Their midbrains became totally hijacked and they linked quote-unquote survival itself to the drug. And as a result, they continued using cocaine despite extremely negative consequences, like death. Dr. Kevin McCauley, the creator of the educational film Pleasure Unwoven, makes a compelling presentation on YouTube showing the exact mechanisms in the midbrain he believes lead to addiction. According to Dr. McCauley, addiction is a dysregulation of the midbrain dopamine pleasure system due to unmanaged stress resulting in symptoms of decreased functioning. Specifically, 1. Loss of control, 2. Craving, 3. Persistent drug use despite negative consequences. Note, more on this broken dopamine pleasure system coming up. The eroded prefrontal cortex. If it were just the hijacked midbrain that you had to deal with, that would certainly make quitting much harder than with a non-hijacked midbrain. However, there is another area of the brain that is equally important, which becomes severely compromised in the case of opioid addiction. Consistent exposure to opioids on a daily basis over time disables part of the brain that regulates impulse control. I prefer the way Dr. Nora Volkow, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, talks about this disabled prefrontal cortex. In the frontline documentary Chasing Heroin, Dr. Volkow states that, quote, all of these drugs with repeated administration erode the function of the prefrontal cortex. The easiest metaphor is driving a car without brakes. You may very well want to stop. If you don't have brakes, you won't be able to do it. End quote. The prefrontal cortex, PFC, is the executive decision-making area of the brain that we evolved most recently in our evolutionary histories. The midbrain kept us alive and procreating long enough to develop the prefrontal cortex. To make healthy decisions that are in your best self-interest on a regular basis, the prefrontal cortex should be operating very efficiently. When the PFC becomes eroded and thus disabled, it's much harder to make decisions that are in your best self-interest, such as the decision to quit and then the action steps of quitting. We may indeed have free will, but a person that has a disabled PFC and a hijacked midbrain at the same time 
has much less free will than a person with a healthy brain in these departments. Our brain health determines the quality of our life. And in the case of opioid addiction, perhaps Dr. Volkow is aware of the hijacked midbrain as she's aware of the disabled PFC. If she is, then the better metaphor for addiction would be not only driving a car without brakes and you want to stop, but driving a car without brakes that also has an accelerator pedal that is jammed down and stuck at 100 miles per hour. Severe opioid addiction is like wanting to stop a car that has a jammed accelerator and no brakes. How on earth do you stop a vehicle like this? There are ways to do it, but you have to be creative. The easiest way I can think of is to find a steep hill and turn up it. Another way would be to drive on a long freeway until you eventually run out of gas. Yet another way could be if you had a parachute set up like the Formula One race cars use to slow down and stop after going dangerously fast. There are many other ways to stop too, if you'll only think outside the box and be creative enough. The Broken Dopamine Pleasure System Most opioids spike dopamine and endorphins. However, some opioids boost other neurotransmitters as well. For example, the novel and fully synthetic opioid tramadol is both an opioid agonist and a selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. This means that along with dopamine and endorphins being boosted, like all opioids do, it also increases serotonin and norepinephrine. However, in this section, we're going to simply cover the neurotransmitter dopamine and how dopamine deficiency syndrome creates a major obstacle to opioid detox and recovery. The repeated use of opioids on a daily basis leads to your brain needing opioids to produce dopamine. Humans are innately hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Thus, one of our important brain functions is to produce a dopamine release anytime we're doing something pleasurable and anytime we're engaging in a behavior that is associated with survival of the individual and survival of the species, procreation. When we engage in sexual intercourse, that leads to a big dopamine release. Dopamine also spikes when we eat certain things, such as high sugar, high salt, and high fat content foods. Think about how the average person feels when they eat chocolate cake, have sex, drink a soda pop, and other things that are often fun and lead to a quick dopamine hit. Dopamine is also called the quote-unquote motivation chemical, and other similar terms as well. Having abundant dopamine levels makes a person more motivated to get things done. It also gives a person a sense of reward and can lead to a very positive mood or even euphoria and pleasure, of course. To begin discussing what I call the broken dopamine pleasure system, we will start off with a brief overview on the importance of our senses. These are our innate faculties of sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. As mind-body-spirit complexes incarnating on Earth, our body complex is our vehicle to experience the physical aspect of life with. We are sensory beings, and when even one of these senses is missing, it lessens our ability to experience and function in the world. For example, I've known people in the past that were deaf, and I've known people that were blind. Not being able to see or not being able to hear makes life much different than having all of our senses. I've also known people that have been paralyzed from the neck down and had no feeling sensations and couldn't walk or even use their arms or hands or anything else. For individuals that cannot smell or taste, I suspect that would also make life less rich in experience. One thing that should have been added to this innate list of senses is our sense of pleasure. Why? Because pleasure is wired into our survival software. Without a sense of pleasure in life, people can become suicidal, and many have committed suicide from this sense being totally gone or largely disabled. Unfortunately, pleasure gets a bad reputation in our culture. Yet, the dopamine pleasure system is involved in survival and is a very important sense that we rely on to have a decent life and especially to have a good life. When a person detoxes from opioids, cold turkey, their brain can take weeks to months to start producing natural dopamine. During this time, many individuals suffer from mild to moderate 
or Severe Dopamine Deficiency Syndrome, DDS. In the thousands of people I've corresponded with, this is almost always one of the most brutal obstacles preventing opioid recovery according to clients and email and comment correspondence. The person detoxing off opioids almost always suffers from anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure. I call it quote-unquote pleasure deafness. It's literally a loss of a person's sense of pleasure. The result ranges from mild depression to more often heavy depression or even total hopelessness 24-7 for weeks on end. In addition to this state of anhedonia, it's pretty much always coupled with mild or moderate fatigue or more often total exhaustion of body and mind. The combination of anhedonia and exhaustion of body and mind due to opioid detox-induced dopamine deficiency was always the main reason I couldn't quit opioids successfully. When you have to work and take care of a kid, you just can't afford to be hopeless and exhausted for multiple weeks or months in a row. Each day feels like an eternity, and the more days in a row you feel like this, the more you worry that you'll never feel normal again. I know exactly how this feels, and I've also helped hundreds of clients make it through this phase of post-acute withdrawal, too. So that's the broken dopamine pleasure system obstacle in a nutshell. And this multifaceted addicted brain is just one of the top seven obstacles. Are you starting to realize how important it is to know in detail exactly what you're up against here? Obstacle two, hyperbolic discounting. What if I told you that one of the main reasons it's so hard to quit opioids is due to our caveman brain wiring? Would that interest you? Because the way our brains are wired to choose immediate rewards rather than far off rewards is totally screwing your ability to get off opioids. This phenomenon is called hyperbolic discounting. Here's how it works. Given two similar rewards, humans show a preference for one that arrives sooner rather than later. Humans are said to quote unquote discount the value of the later reward by a factor that increases with the length of the delay. Hyperbolic discounting is a cognitive bias where you choose smaller, immediate rewards, instant gratification, rather than larger, later rewards, delayed gratification. Your caveman brain. A caveman did not have to contend with the same complex choices we have today. Cavemen and cave women never knew if they were going to even survive the day. So we evolved to choose the immediate options that had the best chance of ensuring survival and procreation. Example, a caveman never had to choose between eating the meat of the animal he hunted and killed today or investing the dead animal in an animal 401k that would yield a big return decades later. Our brains are wired to choose immediate rewards rather than the potential of a far-off future reward. Instant gratification versus delayed gratification. When it comes to opioid addiction recovery, there's a big dilemma. Our brains are literally wired to choose instant rewards, feel good today by using opioids, instead of far-off rewards, feel like crap for a few weeks or longer with the hope that we will eventually feel better sometime down the line after quitting opioids. How do we overcome our brain's natural wiring of hyperbolic discounting and go through the very unfun, is that a word, process of quitting opioids today so that we might feel better in the future? Exercise. Step one, write a list of all the reasons you want to quit opioids. Step two, Write a list of all the ways in which using opioids is causing negative consequences in your health, finances, relationships, career, business, parenting, self-esteem, spirituality, and all other areas of life. Step three, write out a new target identity of how you want to be as a person and what you want your life to look like in the future. Be very specific. Step four, read this document every morning first thing upon waking and every night just before bed. A daily review of all the reasons you want to quit opioids, as well as your new future target identity in life, will start to reprogram your brain. A strong neural connection will be made. Quote, when neurons fire together, they wire together. End quote. 
New brain research shows us that we can literally rewire our brains with neuroplasticity. Obstacle number three, disempowering neuroassociations. The key to quitting opioids and staying quit is to change the way you feel about opioids and recovery. Everything we do in life is either to avoid pain or gain pleasure. Also, we will do much more to avoid pain than we will do to gain pleasure. A fundamental concept to quitting opioids is this. You must link up in your brain ultimate, life-ending, massive pain to using opioids and supreme, life-enhancing pleasure to being clean. That's the secret. However, most people have mixed up or disempowering neuroassociations. Most people on opioids still link pleasure to using them. Others link both pleasure and pain to using opioids. And for the few that link only pain to using opioids, they link even more pain to being clean. And so many are stuck in this cycle because they haven't changed the way their brain thinks. I've been opioid addiction free for a decade, and the main reason I've been able to do this is that I no longer link pleasure to using opioids. I associate being addicted to opioids as a total failure and a horrible life ruled by fear. Also, I link massive pleasure to being addiction-free. I used to hate being sober because I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I needed opioids to feel normal, and so I linked a lot of pain to being clean, since they were actually my antidepressant and anxiety medication. Here are the worst and best neuroassociations for trying to quit opioids. Worst. Associating a 10 out of 10 pleasure and a 1 out of 10 pain to being on daily opioids. Best, associating a 1 out of 10 pleasure and a 10 out of 10 pain to being on daily opioids. Most people are somewhere between these polar opposites on the spectrum. The closer a person is to the middle, the more ambivalence there typically is towards quitting opioids. For example, Imagine a person that associates a 5 out of 10 pleasure and a 5 out of 10 pain to being on daily opioids. As you can probably ascertain, this can lead to a person staying stuck on opioids long term because their neuro associations are not extreme enough. Exercise. Start visualizing all of the pain that will result if you continue to use opioids over the next 1, 5, and 10 years. Then, visualize what your life could be like if you quit opioids now. Then stay clean for the next 1, 5, and 10 years. Figure out what you need to do or think to change your neuro associations so you link massive pain to using opioids and massive pleasure to a life free of opioid dependence. Obstacle number 4. The Three Types of Fear Physiological fear of physical threats, such as running from a saber-toothed tiger or hearing the sounds of a burglar break into your home, cause serious panic and for good reason. However, when it comes to non-physical threat fears, it's usually due to mismanagement of the mind. There are three types of fears that interfere with opioid detox and recovery, and underneath all of these, there is an, quote, assumption of pain, end quote. The three types of fear are 1. Fear of loss 2. Fear of the process 3. Fear of the outcome The following writing exercise will help you uncover, dissect, and reframe any fears that you may have so that you can have an easier time moving forward towards your goal of quitting opioids and feeling great afterward. 1. Write out any fears of loss you may have regarding quitting opioids. Are you afraid you'll lose the pain relief benefits, the anxiety relief benefits, or maybe you'll lose the energy and happiness they may have been providing you with? Write out what you might be fearing you'll lose, and then write every possible benefit you can think of regarding everything you will gain from quitting opioids. For me, I used to get a lot of anxiety relief and a lot of energy from that. I was afraid of losing my calm mindset. I was afraid of losing my happiness, my confidence. I was afraid of losing that energy because I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. What could you possibly be losing? The way to overcome this fear, the solution, is to think about everything that you'll gain. 
and not only think about it, but write out literally everything that you could possibly gain, all the wonderful benefits and all the different areas of your life that you'll gain in. Focus on what you're going to gain and not what you're going to lose. That's the way to overcome the fear of loss. Two, write out any fears of the process you may have regarding quitting opioids. Is there one or more steps of this process that seem too difficult or scary for you? Write these down and then commit to respecting and welcoming the process. Honor the process and even though you may be scared, write out why you're going to go through with it anyway. For me, the biggest thing was the fear of the acute withdrawal. I thought it was going to be so hard and also the post-acute withdrawal where your symptoms last for weeks to months. I didn't think I was going to be able to get through that because in the past I had failed. I had either set a date and not gone through with all the days of acute detox or I did successfully get past that but down the line the post-acute withdrawal was just way too hard. If you're fearing one step or more of this process the solution to overcome the fear of this process is to welcome the process, honor the process, know that it's going to be a challenge and welcome the challenge. 3. Write out any fear of outcome you may have. Are you afraid that you will go for it and then ultimately fail? Or are you afraid that you'll succeed in the short term only to relapse a few weeks or months down the line? Write these down and then commit to not worrying about it and instead link personal fulfillment and perhaps even contribution simply to the act of trying. Obstacle number five. Acute Opioid Withdrawal Syndrome The Central Nervous System Rebound Effect When a dependent individual abruptly stops taking opioids, leading opioid blood concentration to fall below the required level, the now opioid-tolerant central nervous system, CNS, goes haywire. With no inhibitive stimulation to satisfy receptors, the pathways of the CNS fire signals strenuously performing at a level much higher than predependence levels. Now the locus coeruleus responds by triggering the autonomic fight-or-flight response. What results is known as the acute opioid withdrawal syndrome, and it's one of the most horrific experiences an individual could ever go through. Unlike the normal amygdala-activated, fear center of the brain, fight-or-flight response that deactivates quickly the acute opioid withdrawal-induced fight-or-flight response lasts many days or longer depending on the opioid a person is detoxing from. In our hunter and gatherer ancestors, if they saw a saber-toothed tiger, their body would activate the fight-or-flight response. Appetite, bowels, immune system, and other functions of the body would be shut down and they would produce huge amounts of adrenaline and noradrenaline with massive focus and muscle strength going to the legs and arms. This would help to either fight off the tiger or run away to safety. After about 10 to 15 minutes after they made it to safety from running away, the sympathetic nervous system fight or flight response would quickly begin to shut down and their parasympathetic nervous system would begin activating instead. This is the quote-unquote rest and digest division of the autonomic nervous system. Breathing normalizes bowel function and immune function return. Stress chemicals phase out and the hunter-gatherer that made it to safety would be relaxing again. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen during acute opioid withdrawal. This cascade of stress hormones keeps going and keeps going, causing days and nights of anxiety, insomnia, restlessness, and fight-or-flight hell on earth for a person doing nothing to treat their withdrawal symptoms or not having a doctor or medical facility treat them. The gastrointestinal rebound effect. In addition to the CNS rebound effect, there is also a rebound of the gastrointestinal GI system. Opioids bind to mu opioid receptors in the large intestine, and that's why one of the effects is a constipating mechanism of action. After a person becomes physiologically dependent on opioids, along with their neurons needing daily opioids to function normally, the gastrointestinal system also needs opioids to function normally. Thus, during the acute opioid withdrawal syndrome, 
there is not a return to the normal GI baseline, but instead a rebound effect in the opposite direction. The result is diarrhea, stomach pain, nausea, vomiting, difficulty eating, and other GI problems. With the combination of both the CNS and GI rebound effects, a person can experience a host of physical and psychological withdrawal symptoms. Physical opioid withdrawal symptoms may include, but are not limited to, diarrhea, aching muscles and limbs, gastrointestinal GI distress, nausea, hot and cold sweats and chills, goosebumps, vomiting, teary eyes, a runny nose, sneezing, fatigue, restless leg syndrome, RLS, psychological, mental emotional, opioid withdrawal symptoms may include, but are not limited to, anxiety, insomnia, depression, panic attacks, social anxiety, anhedonia, inability to feel pleasure, suicidal thoughts, stress, inability to relax, lack of motivation, fear. As you can see, there are plenty of unpleasant acute withdrawal symptoms that can afflict you while you're coming off opioids. The really awful aspect of acute withdrawal is that you get hit with a ton of different physical and psychological withdrawal symptoms. If it were just one or the other, it wouldn't be near as horrific of an experience. But alas, this isn't the case. Acute opioid withdrawal symptoms are both physical and psychological. And most of the time, these symptoms are very severe. Unfortunately, there also seems to be a synergy between these physical and psychological symptoms. They both make each other seem worse, and thus, it's an experience that mere words in a book cannot do justice in explaining. Luckily, in Chapter 10, you'll learn how to reduce the severity of these symptoms using opioid detox biohacking protocols. There are many detox protocols and withdrawal mitigators with proven efficacy such as prescription medications, over-the-counter medicines, natural remedies, dietary supplements, natural legal drugs, and home remedies. Acute Withdrawal Timelines Depending on whether you're detoxing off short-acting or long-acting opioids, the withdrawal timelines will differ. For example, for short-acting opioids, the acute withdrawal is typically around four days although it can last up to seven days for certain people with slower opioid metabolisms. Each person is unique. For long-acting opioids, the acute withdrawal timeline can last anywhere from 7 to 14 days or even 21 days or longer for certain individuals. Tapering. Lowering opioid dosage systematically over the span of time can actually help you to prevent going through acute opioid withdrawal. People that have the discipline to adhere to a taper regimen often have the easiest time detoxing off opioids, as the tapering process reduces shock to your brain and body. The longer the taper duration, typically, the easier the transition completely off opioids. You'll learn about tapering in detail in Chapter 10, but for now, you should know that most people I've corresponded with and worked with opted to go cold turkey because they didn't have the self-discipline to taper. I was never able to taper either because if I had opioids, I wanted to feel as good as possible every day. Luckily, you don't need a taper to quit opioids and heal from OUD. 6. Post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Pause. Many opioid-addicted individuals have successfully managed to get past the acute withdrawal symptoms phase only to realize that the struggle was far from being over. Though the symptoms, duration, and severity vary, an estimated 90% of all individuals quitting opioids experience post-acute withdrawal syndrome, pause, to some degree after the acute withdrawal is over. To accurately and simply define pause, let's break down the meaning of each individual word. Post, after, acute. Very serious or dangerous, requiring serious attention or action. Withdrawal. The discontinuance of administration or use of a drug. Syndrome. A group of symptoms. Simply put, pause is a group of symptoms that occur after an individual has gone through the serious withdrawal phase induced by the discontinuation of drugs. In his popular book, Staying Sober, A Guide for Relapse Prevention, 
Terence Gorski states the following, quote, Post-acute withdrawal is a group of symptoms of addictive disease that occur as a result of abstinence from addictive chemicals. In the alcoholic slash addict, these symptoms appear 7 to 14 days into abstinence after stabilization from the acute withdrawal. Post-acute withdrawal is a biopsychosocial syndrome. It results from a combination of damage to the nervous system caused by alcohol or drugs and the psychosocial stress of coping with life without drugs or alcohol, end quote. There is a wide range of symptoms an individual might experience from pause. Post-acute opioid withdrawal symptoms will vary from person to person. Post-acute symptoms will also vary in severity from person to person. Some common post-acute opioid withdrawal symptoms include inability to think clearly, memory problems, emotional overreactions or numbness, physical coordination problems, stress sensitivity, hostility, anxiety, depression, insomnia, increased susceptibility to emotional and physical pain, gastrointestinal issues, intense craving to use opioids, drug dreams, fatigue, inability to experience pleasure, pleasure deafness. I strongly believe that the last two symptoms, pleasure deafness and fatigue, is the number one reason why most individuals going through pause relapse within the first 90 days of getting sober off opioids. Going weeks to months without feeling any pleasure in life, and on top of that having no energy or motivation, is in my opinion more detrimental to recovery than any of the other post-acute withdrawal symptoms. Pause typically lasts for several weeks or months. Luckily, there are many things you can do to shorten the healing time and feel better fast. Pause Timeline Pause can last anywhere from a couple of weeks to more often 4 to 12 weeks and up to 4 to 6 months and even longer in very severe cases. Most of the clients I've worked with are 80% to 90% healed from pause within 2 to 6 weeks. Even my clients in their 50s, 60s, and 70s usually feel 100% better or close to it by the 5-6 to six week marker. And I've had many clients in their 20s and 30s that have felt 100% better or close to it within 2-3 to three weeks after detoxing from opioids. In Chapter 11, you're going to learn how to create your own hierarchy of opioid recovery treatment plan to make it much easier and faster going through this phase of opioid detox. Some of the things you'll learn about are supplementation, diet, hydration, sleep, exercise, and many other powerful natural therapies. Obstacle number seven, neurotransmitter deficiencies. This section will be some review, but I think it's important to do so. The more times and ways you hear this, the more it will sink in and better equip you to succeed in healing from OUD on your next attempt. After using opioids daily for around a month and especially longer, once you come off the drugs, you'll have neurotransmitter deficiencies that can lead to a multitude of psychological and even physical health issues. Opioid daily use leads to a minimum of a deficiency in the following neurotransmitters. Endorphins, dopamine. Endorphins and dopamine are neurotransmitters, which are substances that transmit nerve impulses across a synapse. The brain uses neurotransmitters to tell your heart to beat, your lungs to breathe, and your stomach to digest. They also play a huge role in mood, concentration, sleep and weight, and can cause a number of negative consequences when they become out of balance. Endorphins. Endorphins are our natural painkillers, endogenous opioids. Our bodies release endorphins when we exercise. Perhaps you've heard of runner's high, which describes a euphoric feeling produced by the massive production of endorphins after running long distances. Endorphins promote joy, euphoria, and contentment, and that leads us to why opioids make you feel so good. Different drugs mimic different neurotransmitters. Opioids specifically mimic endorphins. That's why opioids are so beneficial for relieving pain and producing euphoria. When an opioid is taken, the body produces massive amounts of endorphins in quantities our bodies weren't designed to handle. 
If you use opioids consistently over a period of time, the body starts making more opioid receptors, and that's how tolerance is developed. Now the brain has become dependent on opioids to produce endorphins, and it stops making them naturally. The problem arises when someone on opioids lowers their dosage considerably or comes off completely. You are now supplying your body with fewer endorphins from the drugs, but your brain doesn't supply you with the rest. Your brain short circuits, and therein lies the problem. What results is a massive endorphin deficiency, leading to increased sensitivity to physical and emotional pain, among other problems. Dopamine. Dopamine is our main focus neurotransmitter. Dopamine is also responsible for our drive, or desire to get things done, our motivation. Dopamine lifts the dark clouds of depression, is responsible for feelings of pleasure, and plays a role in the quote-unquote reward system in the brain. Prolonged use of opioids leads to a continuous spike in dopamine levels. Over time, the brain eventually adjusts natural production of the neurotransmitter to compensate for the presence of opioids. Due to both the overactivation of dopamine during periods of opioid intoxication and long-term changes in brain chemistry, natural dopamine levels become lowered and depleted. Once your dopamine levels are depleted, it's virtually impossible to experience pleasure without using the drug. Things that used to provide you with pleasure no longer do so, such as a job promotion, your kid scoring the winning goal at a soccer game, or listening to your favorite music. You no longer derive enjoyment from these activities. It now takes a huge spike in dopamine, drugs, sex, gambling, etc., to feel pleasure. This is one of the top reasons why individuals often relapse within a few months of getting off opioids. They have anhedonia, pleasure deafness, life basically sucks, and they are also sensitive to physical and emotional pain due to the endorphin deficiency. Enough is enough, they feel like they can't go on feeling so bad every day, so they use. Thus, the cycle continues. Below is a list of the most important neurotransmitters for mental health. Endorphins slash enkephalins are natural painkillers. They promote feelings of physical relaxation, joy, and produce a natural high. Serotonin, responsible for feelings of being emotionally relaxed and happy. GABA, mentally relaxing, your brain's natural valium. Catecholamines, dopamine is in this class of neurotransmitters, responsible for concentration and euphoria. Amino acid therapy. The best way to restore healthy neurotransmission after getting off opioids is to use amino acid therapy. Amino acid supplements are amazing because they help you produce neurotransmitters naturally and quickly, thus repairing your drug-damaged brain. You'll learn about amino acid therapy in Chapter 11, and it's a fascinating topic. That can help you heal much faster when used in an effective way. Other strategies for rebalancing neurotransmitters are diet and exercise and even more, which are also coming in Chapter 11. Other Common Obstacles to Opioid Recovery Now that you're trained up on the top seven obstacles that pretty much every person will encounter when attempting to quit opioids, let's briefly discuss some of the other obstacles that people might be up against depending on their unique situation. Here are other common obstacles, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. Responsibilities. Work, kids, domestic duties, appointments, etc. Low distress tolerance. Intrinsic motivation not high enough. Intrinsic and extrinsic incentives not powerful enough. Chronic stress. Underlying mental health issues. Anxiety disorder, depression disorder, bipolar disorder, PTSD, Trauma, emotional suppression, repression, etc. Underlying physical health issues, such as chronic pain, chronic fatigue, etc. Not enough accountability. Not enough support. Not enough discipline. You don't have strong enough reasons to quit. Your health and vitality are significantly suffering. The five phases of opioid recovery. After a decade of researching and teaching the science of opioid detox and the art of opioid recovery, I've come to realize that there are essentially five phases of opioid recovery. And by arming yourself with the knowledge of these phases and what each consists of, you'll significantly increase your chance of getting off opioids 
for good while feeling great without drugs. This is just one way to view the process, and it's what I use with my coaching clients. It serves as a powerful and helpful mental model framework to organize the process in your mind and to perform operationally to successfully recover fully and permanently. The five phases of opioid recovery are 1. Learn, plan. What you're doing now. Learning comes first, and then, once you've learned enough and you're ready, you start planning your recovery and setting a start date, etc. 2. Detox. This is the process of getting opioids all the way out of your body. It can be done slowly by tapering over the span of weeks or months or even years, or it can be done quickly by a cold turkey detox, either at home, at an outpatient detox, or an inpatient detox program. You'll learn about these options in detail in Chapter 10. 3. Repair. This is my name for the pause phase. You're repairing your brain and body with natural therapies and rebalancing your neurotransmitters and repairing your endocrine system, liver, etc. 4. Rewire. Over time, old neural pathways of the addictive process of cravings, triggers, obsessive-compulsive behaviors, etc. will fade away, and through new and healthy lifestyle strategies, new neural pathways of recovery will form. The superhighways of addiction will turn into one-way dirt roads, and then turn into roads of recovery that strengthen over time and transform into superhighways of health and relapse immunity. 5. Recover! Exclamation mark. This is technically not a phase, but the end goal, what I call the finish line and exclamation mark. It's your reward for beating the odds and making it through all the adversity to achieve your transformation. Final thoughts. Now that you're familiar with the seven obstacles and the five phases of opioid recovery, you're much more equipped to heal from OUD. Knowledge is not power. However, it's potential power. Applied knowledge is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Apply this knowledge to your own life and you'll be much more equipped to quit opioids on your next attempt. I went through so much pain and suffering by having to learn all of these concepts the long and hard way. I was utterly miserable and continued to fail because I didn't know the enemy, which were the top seven obstacles to opioid recovery, and I didn't know myself very well. Now you can benefit from my suffering and also the past decade of my research and teaching and working with people. And since you know all about the enemy, you're ready to move on to the next chapter where you'll learn how to know thyself. When you know thyself and know thy enemy, you'll be able to use the art of war to heal from addiction and build your best life. I'm excited about this next section because knowing yourself helps with everything in life not just opioid addiction recovery. Thus, let's continue our journey together as we switch gears to the internal strategy of mindset.